championships, man, it was like the best feeling like on earth. You're out there winning one year after the next after the next. I mean, I felt like a rock star, I'm not gonna lie. I was like on top of the world. People call me crazy, an enigma, lost, all these things. And the whole time in the back of my head, I'm like, that's not who I am. Shamiqua coming forward and telling her story, speaking about something that people don't want to talk about, that puts a name and a face to the issue. Hi everyone, my name is Anna Tadevosian and I will be your moderator today alongside with my colleague from World Learning, Vlad Spencer. I want to thank you for being here today with us. Uh, this prog program is part of the International Sports Programming Initiative, a State Department Sports Diplomacy Exchange Program implemented by World Learning. The webinar is produced by World Learning and Digital Communication Network, a coalition of digital influencers for improving the information space. Today, we will chat with um, our good friend, former WNBA player, six-time All-Star, World Cup and Olympic gold medalist, Shamika Holstba. In 2018, Shamika was inducted into Women's Basketball Hall of Fame. Shamika, thank you for being us today. Thank you. Uh, for thank yeah. you. Thanks for ha having me, everyone. Sure, we are glad to have you here today. And um, I want to start um, with a question about how you started, why you chose basketball to be your sport and how it all started. Oh, wow. Um, I always say basketball kind of fell in my lap. Um, at the time, me and my brother, we went to go live with my grandmother. Uh, we left a, a suburban area to go to um, uh, inner city um, in, New in New York City. And so, as you know, New York City, we like to say it's the Mecca of basketball and there are a lot of outdoor courts. So I grew up with a very strict grandmother who didn't want me just hanging out on the corner or anything. I had to uh, do things around discipline and structure. So the basketball court happened to be like right outside her window so she could keep an eye on me. So I would always go play. Um, and um, I just loved it. But the odd thing was at that time, I was the only girl with a bunch of guys. And it was kind of tough because the other girls, they didn't get why I wanted to play basketball with the boys. So I was teased, um, I was bullied, but I loved it. So I would just continue to, to go out there and play. And then eventually I'm like, oh man, I'm better than a lot of these boys. <laughs> and, and I would play on the teams um, with them as, as the only girl. So I would say I, I gained a lot of respect by do, doing that. Uh, I, uh, in the movie, there is a place where it said that you are, you can, could be the face of, you know, WNBA being kind of equal to NBA. So mm -hmm. what do you think about this? Like, as you said, uh, playing with boys and you understood that you were much better than some boys. So what do you mm -hmm. think? Why still WNBA can be that, that one? Oh, so uh, being, being the face of the, be, coming into WNBA and being the face. Now, for those of you don't, who don't know, um, I, I grew up thinking I'm going to be the first woman to play in the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> because there was not there was not opportunities at that time for for women to continue professional um, sports in the United States uh, basketball. So I said, OK, I'm going to, you know, play for the NBA. So that was always my goal. So when the WNBA came about, I was really excited. It was during my sophomore year in, in college. So there was a lot of hype. You know, you're seeing the, the mega stars, the Lisa Leslie, Cheryl Spoops and Rebecca Lobo kind of be the face of it. And I was at that time um, competing at a really high level in college. And so my coach is like, that's going to be you. And so when I came to the WNBA, I became uh, one of the faces uh, of the league um, and got drafted first pick 1999 to the Washington uh, Mystics. And your number 23, I, I saw you played in, in high school, number 23 and in college. Right. So you chose it because of Michael Jordan and then they named you woman Michael Jordan or it just the quote? Right. So, so uh, first, okay. First in high school, I, I was always wanted to be like a big guard, right? So I always tell Magic Johnson was actually my favorite player. 
now number 32. But what happened was um, in high school, the jerseys kind of went by size. So the number 32 was so big for me. <laughs> so I was went home crying. I was like, I can't get my number. And they actually gave me a number 23, right? So I go home and my grandmother said, okay, number 23 for Michael Jordan and for um, the 23rd Psalm, because she was a very spiritual uh, a woman. So I said, you're right. And she goes, Michael Jordan is the best player. And um, I started to cheer up a little bit. And yes, I, I continued to pick uh, number 23. But that was kind of hard, Anna, um, you know, because being considered uh, the female Michael Jordan, because every couple years, they like to say, this athlete is the next Michael Jordan. But, you know, I consider it a compliment, I guess, because um, as we've seen with this documentary on ESPN, he yeah. is the greatest. <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> Truly. Okay, now I will give the virtual floor to Vlad to go through your life, basically. <laughs> thank you. Oh. Thank you, Anna. That's complicated. <laughs> thank, you, <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Anna. And thank you, thank you, Shamika. So, Shamika, you know that you are one of our favorites. People. So mm -hmm. I want to thank mm -hmm. you not only for being with us, but also mm -hmm. for being part of um, the exchange programs done by Sports Diplomacy. And I know that Ryan Murphy is also with us, the program officer from the State Department, so he's going to say a few words at the, at the end, mm -hmm. hopefully. Uh, we want to, to go, um, you know, more through your life, as Anna said, because we are trying to tell, uh, you know, the power story of your tremendous success in basketball as a sports person mm -hmm. and your, your, your fight. With, uh, with with mental mental disease and and how these two uh, kind of interacted with, you know throughout your career. So one one mm -hmm. question I would like to, to ask you because you know you talked about the beginnings. You talked about high school and the role that your grandmother played in, in, in your life. Were there any signs at this at that point? You know during high school that should have been you know worrisome or maybe addressed in relation to the to the uh, you know mental issue. Uh, yes, there were signs. Um, my grandmother realized that I was dealing with depression from an uh, early age. I think it was around 11 or 12. She took me to therapy. Um, I was going through a major transition because um, I went to go, me and my brother were actually taking away from my parents because um, they were struggling with alcoholism. And we went to go live with my uh, grandmother. So I was going through a bunch of emotions, even though they're saying this household is dysfunctional, that's still my mom and dad. So emotionally, I was really like struggling. I was in a new environment, new school, new friends, and I would just really get uh, depressed. And my signs early on were I wanted to like really always be by myself. I wanted to wear dark colored clothes. Um, I would have temper tantrums, like uh, bursts of anger. So I would like throw stuff across my room. And so I went to therapy, went to therapy around 11 or 12 years old. But culturally, I know in my household, um, and some people are different. It's like, what happens in your house, like stays in your house, Vlad. I could, you don't want to talk about like the bad things of your personal life outside. Um, so I learned to keep things inside, not, ex not express myself. And so that kind of followed me um, throughout my, my life. Yeah, and it's something, it's something very common. That means, you know, it's getting a little bit better these days with young people, mm -hmm. uh, more awareness, you know, parents, uh, you know, more concern. So do you feel a, a difference between, you know, the way that mental disease was, was dealt with at that time in your life and what is going on right now? That means in terms of awareness, acceptance, and, and, and actually, you know, trying to, to solve the issue. Right. Yes, it's been a change. Uh, mental awareness is such a, as a high right now. And the reason it's at a high is because um, we're kicking down stigma and stigma, you know, we changed this conversation about it due to the fact people are sharing. That's how we learn things about, you know, different cultures, different ethnicities is by story uh, telling. And I know for me, when I was going through it, uh, when I was diagnosed with bipolar, I was like, oh my God, you know, thinking it's the end of the world. But I had to realize who's gone through this. It was Catherine Zeta-Jones. Catherine Zeta-Jones was my person. <laughs> Um, because she has struggled with bipolar disorder and she would talk about it. And it's people like her that just inspired me to become a little more resilient um, in my own personal uh, struggle. Definitely. So before uh, going to, uh, you know, the college um, you know, stage of, of your development mm -hmm. and career, I want to, um, uh, you know, thank the audience for being with us. And if you guys 
have questions, there is a chat room, uh, I don't know how experience you have with Zoom, so please um, ask, ask the questions there, and, and towards the end of this presentation, we'll get to uh, the questions that will make it more interactive. So again, thanks for being with us. Now, college. So you went um, you know, to the, the team in Tennessee, um, mm -hmm. you know, it has been tremendous success, but uh, one thing I would like to, you to talk about is uh, your coach. Right. And, you know, Pat Summit, and, and, and I know that, that she played a tremendous role in, in your life, but, you know, reading the interviews that you gave, the beginnings were not so smooth, that means, you know, so there was a little bit of friction in the beginning before becoming yeah. this amazing relationship that continued mm -hmm. throughout the coach's life. Right. It was it was a tough adjustment. First of all, I'm from New York City, so I'm going from New York City to Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, the pace is definitely different. Um, I think a lot of young athletes, when we pick out colleges, um, we need to be more aware uh, as far as like research. I didn't realize that Ten University of Tennessee was 98% Caucasian, 2% other. Um, coming from New York, I was used to a lot more um, diversity. So just like anyone, um, I go to this campus it's, it's, it's a unknown environment for me in that sense. And so I'm trying to navigate and I was getting homesick. I was, I was stressed going through a, a bunch of emotions. And I remember talking to coach summit and she's like, don't worry, you know, you're just, we're, we're your family. You're going to figure out what this sisterhood was about. And she taught me a good lesson. And she's like, we fear the unknown, you know, sometimes we have to buy into it. And I really bought into it. And that family, that Tennessee became my second family. But with Coach Summit, that woman is tough. And when I tell you she got every bit of talent out of me that she could, and it wasn't always pretty. I mean, I didn't got kicked out of practice, um, clipboards thrown at me. But guess what? I walked away winning three out of four championships, and I walked away understanding. When you step on that court, you step on that field, that's business. You're focused. You're locked in. Now, once you finish, She's going to hug you. She's going to support you. But it really prepared me for life, you know, understanding, hey, when I'm at task and I have to focus on something or I'm competing or I'm, I'm in a position of leadership, it's about getting the job done. We can laugh and joke about things later. You, you know, she's an iconic figure in coaching. That means, you know, mm -hmm. so, so and you, um, you know, talk you know, so much about, about, about her and you're in touch with her. What makes her like this? Obviously, you, you mentioned certain things, but mm -hmm. what made her this, this coach that made a, a difference, not only in terms of success of that team, but in, in your life, not only yours, but, but you know, players in general? Well, I think the thing that when I talk to my other teammates and women that have passed through the University of Tennessee program playing for Coach Pat Summit, the number one thing is that she makes you understand worth ethic, you know? She worked hard. You saw it. She's always studying to be great. Number two, I think why she has so much success and over, what was it, 37 years I think she coached, um, is being able to understand basketball when you have a team of all different personalities. It's understanding how to manage these personalities. Each kid is, is different. And learning how not – you treat everybody uh, fair, but how you have to know how – you're going to reach another kid versus a, another. And I think also a thing that made um, her successful is, you know, understanding um, the equity piece as, as a woman, you know, when she first started at Tennessee, she said, you know, they, she was in a back room somewhere doing laundry, washing uniforms. She maybe had a budget of like $14,000 for the team and for herself to know that, her hard work, you know, she always said, everybody works hard, but you have to learn how to also work smart. And also having the, po understanding the power of your voice. I was always very, very shy. I was a great talent, but very quiet until myself. And she goes, you know, like my grandma used to tell me, Shamiqua, a closed mouth doesn't get fed. You know, you have to speak up for what you want. And she was really aware of the different uh, backgrounds of people that she brought together. You know, she always said, said, hey, we're all different. We're all different, different journeys as far as our family and experiences. But hey, we're coming together. We're coming together for a common thing. 
and we're going to learn. So I was going home with people, you know, riding horses and, uh, um, you know, taking rides to Florida to be with teammates to really invest in it. And that's what Coach Summit taught us. And I think that's why the women that have played for her are out there in the world doing some amazing things. You shy. How to imagine. <laughs> yeah. Very, very, very shy, very shy. But you know, you, you grow up and I had to, it took me until I was like probably 30. Um, and actually on one of our tricks, uh, trips together, I think we were in, was it Columbia? Yeah. And Hazel, Hazel, um, actually we were at, a, we competed at the same time because she was at my rival school, Florida, University of Florida. I was at Tennessee and, you know, a Olympic track athlete comes from a pedigree of her sister's. And she told me, she goes, oh, my God, she, she, Shmiqua, you have an amazing story. She goes, it's so powerful. And she goes, but you're so shy. She's like, you have to claim your, your greatness. And so I actually learned a lot from her and we remained friends. And again, that was sports. That was sports. Uh, it was uh, impact work that we were doing over in um, Columbia. And look at that, I walked away, you know, at a, I'm supposed to be out there giving to that community. I walked away with something and that's what sports does for you. Yeah, so uh, we'll get back to, to Coach Summit because, you know, uh, towards the end of her life, she was diagnosed with dementia and the way that she dealt with, uh, you know, it was important. Mm -hmm. let's, let's continue uh, this journey throughout your career. So from college professional, yeah, so you're, you're um, you know, selected by the, by the Mystics in 1999, mm -hmm. 98. Um, you know, one thing I could tell you is that I was in Washington at that time when you were extremely excited to have you because <laughs> Washington teams don't win too often. So, right. so it, was, it was a good thing. Uh, but, you know, it talked about in, in, in a book and in an interview is about this idea of, you know, on one hand, the excitement of professional career with everything that entails, is a Nike contract, a new apartment, everything. On the other hand, leaving back the, the, the comfort zone, you know, kind of the safety that, that you know, the security that both your grandma and, and Coach Summit gave you. So talk, talk to, to us a little bit about that period. Uh, yeah, that comfort zone, um, people don't realize how important it is to kind of have that support system. So like you said, here I am, you know, I grew up in a very uh, disciplined environment with my grandmother and my grandmother and Coach Summit did an exchange. You know, Coach Summit knew what my grandmother wanted. Um, she was had those same principles and let me. Now here I am now, you know, 21 years old, I've had such a uh, great leadership in my life. Now I'm thrown back in the city, um, you know, trying to navigate, you know, this newfound success, you know, um, the attention, uh, the financial reward, and you can kind of get lost as a young person, you know, and I'm not saying lost uh, in a sense is like, um, you know, partying or, you know, buying all these expensive things or whatever. I'm saying lost in the sense of, you know, having that touchback, you know, when things are kind of stressed, you know, going and sitting, you know, in the room with my grandmother or going to sit in Coach Summit's office, I had to grow up really fast and learn a lot for myself because unlike operating in a program, I'm saying a program like at a Tennessee or, 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 or uh, like my grandmother's household, professional sports is different. You know, here I am with women, you know, from age, you know, 21 to 35 or higher, you know, playing, um, you're going to have, as we saw in the uh, Michael Jordan special right now, you have people on the team who um, can party like the Dennis Rodman's all night uh, and show up and play. You have those who are not maximizing. So I had to get, get used to that. I, I was used to everybody being in, everybody being one. And it was just so many uh, pieces. So I really, I really struggled to, to try to bring that together. I think probably uh, my third year there and that's when I really started you know trying to create this environment of sisterhood and, and togetherness and uh, the beginning of the mystics uh, you know it went very well now the mystics the olympics the, all this all these records that you, you you set so tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about you know the professional career from a basketball perspective oh man it was it was great I came in uh I, I i made my first year like all WNBA. i made uh, you know rookie of the year so everything was going good the mystics won i think three games the year before i came and so um we won 12 it's an improvement 
um, because as the number one pick on any organization, most likely you're going to the worst team. But one thing I can say is that D.C., the fans were supportive. Um, I know with the WNBA, sometimes for a lot of um, high-level collegiate athletes, the drop-off in attendance is, is, is can be pretty bad. Um, in college, you know, I'm having 20,000 people watch us sometimes. On the average, you know, 10, 11,000 people a night. But when I came to the Mystics, you know, I didn't know what to expect. But D.C., oh, my God, we led the league in attendance. Um, thankfully to A. Poland, who was a great uh, owner and community person, we would have like 12, 15,000 people coming to watch us play. So the excitement was there, um, but we just, you know, kind of struggled at times to get it together. I know, I was one of them. So, you know, I, I, I was <laughs> a big this year, so definitely you could come in. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about the, the first kind of serious episode of depression, which came during the your, your, your mystics time uh, and right. you know, and we described it in, in many in many ways in many many places but let's go a little bit through it exactly what what, what happened oh so um i had uh, lost my lost my grandmother and that was like my rock that was my person and i i was just really um in a dark place you know i couldn't think clearly um i was having uh when I say an emotional stir, so I would have moments when I would just start crying and I was dealing with this pretty much by myself because I didn't want my mom. My mom was sober at that time for years. I didn't want her to backslide and start drinking again. So I tell people, it's like I, I buried my grandmother and I buried my emotions. What I, what I did not know um, at that time was about triggers. Because a year later, you know, my grandmother, I buried her. I had my best WNBA season. I put everything into basketball, but I never dealt with the underlying emotional um, stuff. And that was like the grief and the pain that I was dealing with daily. Um, so I had what they, what they call like a, a situation where trauma can come up later. So my grand, grandfather passed away. And so it opened up like a bunch of stuff. I remember going about to go hang out with my friends and I pull over on the side of the road, not far from my house. And I just start crying. Like I'm just mentally uh, spun. Um, don't know if I'm coming or going. And I remember going to practice and telling them, Hey, something's not right and whatever. And I lost track after that of like three days. And what happened was everybody's looking for me for what they told me. Uh, the team is worried. Um, I had um, a, a manic episode, and so I was really uh, in, a, in a dark place. And so most people would say manic episode, if you don't understand that, it's uh, almost like a, a nervous breakdown, you know, a little different, but, you know, it's almost like a nervous breakdown where I had suicidal ideation. So in my mind, I was thinking about taking my life. Um, I didn't want to be here anymore. I remember uh, wanting to be with my grandmother. And so this was my, 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 my plan. And thankfully, um, when I was missing in action, one person had the keys to my house. And Coach Summit had flew there. Um, she had got past my doorman. Um, you know, he let her. She said she was knocking. She knew I was in there, but I didn't answer. And um, my friend, Dr. Greenfield, actually was away on vacation. She came back. She heard the news and she opened up the door. And, and that's when she got me out, got me showered and took me to get some help. So uh, as a result of that, and it's interesting, one thing that you, you wrote um, is that for as long as I remember, basketball um, had been my drug of choice. And it was mm -hmm. like at that point, it wasn't enough anymore. So like you, you said that you kind of you maxed out mm -hmm. the dos dosage. So, so uh, mm -hmm. you know, so tell us a, a little bit about, about how you felt because, you know, this led to you leaving the mystics. Right. And, and at some mm -hmm. point you, you wrote, and this was actually interesting, you know, to, to read, is that, you know, you, you wrote that that was a, was a big mistake, actually, to, to, leave, to leave the mystics in that type mm -hmm. of circumstance. So right. tell us a little bit about, about, you know, obviously, you know, how you felt, but, but, you know, what led to that decision and why do you think, if you still think, that it wasn't the, the, the good decision? 
Well, first, first of all, you know, like you said, sports for so long, even when I was going through my stuff as a youth uh, with my parents, it's always been my coping mechanism. Like I could go shoot some shots. My grandmother taught me all that anger and frustration you feel, you know, don't, don't do nothing outside because someone might hurt you, but take it out in your, in basketball. And so I did just that. So I know the joy, I know the balance that brought to my life, but at this point in time, you know, the thing that always gave me that peace, it, it, it was, it, it wasn't helping. Like I couldn't just go to the basketball court. These thoughts weren't leaving my mind. It because it caused me to become paranoid. So I'm thinking uh, that my teammates know what's going on, you know, with me. Um, it forced me um, into uh, isolation. Uh, and being young, I, I, I want to say being young, a lot of times when we deal with adversity, the first thing that we do, and it's people in general, but I'm speaking to my, my young self, is that, oh, my God, you run away. You don't, you don't want to face it. And that's what I did. You know, DC was willing to, the mystics wanted me there. They was willing to work with me. They were made aware of everything that I was dealing with. But in my mind, I thought the grass was going to be greener on the other side. So I'm like, no, I don't want to be here anymore. And the reason I didn't want to be there, I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed that I was struggling with these things. Little did I know if I would have had the courage at that time to really speak about it and to, and to claim my truth, I could have made an impact. I'm in the most powerful place, right? We know a lot of decisions are, are made in DC. A lot of mental health organizations are based there. Imagine if I would have said that I was struggling with that um, and, and been there. I could have really been in the position to help um, a lot more people early in my life. So I, I, I regret it. Those, the, those people, I'm still a fan um, of the Washington Mystics and a lot of the faces are still there from when I played as far as the, the staff and that's my that's my family always will be. And let's not forget that we have the champions now, yeah, domestics. Right, right. We're right. we still we're still waiting for the parade, but you know, unfortunately, the coronavirus <laughs> spoiled right. those plans. So we have we want right. to hear. So uh, so then you moved to Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and and in Los Angeles, you know, again, great hopes. You you are with other other stars mm -hmm. in the team, and and things went went well. But then then there was another episode. So you have a trip to the east. Um, oh. you, you visit with your father, you visit with your, your you know, step, your stepfather mm -hmm. has, has cancer. So that all this, this accumulation of pressures, you know, from within mm -hmm. and from, from out, and, and then a crisis happens. Right. And so, like, yeah, the crisis did happen. So, all right, we think, leaving D.C., right, we see palm trees. I'm living, like, two blocks from the beach. Um, everything is supposed to be great. I was an all-star that year, but I remember... Uh, you know, my dad was struggling, or my stepdad was struggling with cancer. My dad was dealing with some uh, mental health issues of, of his own. So I asked to be excused. Um, the league found it, or, you know, they're like, okay, you can go home and be with your family. So I went there. And again, something triggered within me. Um, and I came back after visiting my family and I just fell down that rabbit hole again. Um, and I sat there in my apartment and, you know, everybody knows, like, at that time, we would have social gatherings. We weren't, like, super big drinkers or anything. But I just remember we had some Jack Daniels there. I remember looking on my counter. And so I just was, I was tired. And that's how I framed it in my mind. I was tired. Again, I wanted to be with my grand. I overdosed um, on my brain medication and um, chased it and chased it with the alcohol. And luckily, um, and I don't know if it's like, was my cry for help, but somebody was watching over me because I actually called the only person who had the key to my house. And that was the young lady who walked my dog. And she could tell when I called her to thank her for watching the dog, she said she could tell something was not right in my voice. And she made her, her way over uh, to my place. And you know she realized this was a bad situation, got me to urgent care. Next thing you know, the urgent care doctor is freaking out. And he's like, oh, my God, this is bad. You know, we got to get you to the hospital. And I found myself now in the ambulance headed to Centinella Hospital in Los Angeles. And it was what I experienced uh, was probably, probably um, 
at that time, one of the, the worst nights uh, of, my, of my life because I overdosed on brain medication. So I'm having severe hallucinations. Uh, the cowboy with the lasso is chasing me. I'm, I'm in, a dark, in, in, a, in a place where I think I'm gonna die. Um, I'm vomiting all over the place. They don't wanna pump my stomach. So they're trying to give me the fluid to, uh, to take. And I walked away from that. I remember the doctor saying, it's gonna be a, a rough night. We have to make sure she doesn't have seizures or anything. And when I woke up, I woke up in this all white room and I was in the VIP suite, you get it? VIP suite on the suicide watch. And I, I asked myself like, how did I, how did I get here? And I said, oh my God, God, if you get me out of this situation, um, I will use my voice to, to help others um, that are struggling like myself. And the doctor came in, Vlad, and he said, you're lucky. He goes, I don't know much about women's basketball, but I know who you are. And you can't let things uh, get this bad, you know. And um, But still, I was struggling. I was struggling with the fact, you know, and I, I talk to a lot of people who struggle with mental health concerns, and especially athletes. You know, we're used to being in control of our bodies, you know, um, I can, I know how to get faster. I know how to get in shape. I know how to jump higher and the things that I need to do. And now these people are telling me like, I'm not in control of like my head, just chop it off, not in control of my mind. It was really a struggle for me um, throughout, throughout my life, you know, until probably, you know, 34 years old, because a lot of times people who are, are on medication and I had to take medication to stabilize. We, when you start feeling good, right? When you start, oh, everything's great. And you know, the, the, the color comes back in life. Uh, we stopped taking my medication. And so that's what I would do when I would go overseas. I'm like, oh man, new environment, I'm stimulated. So man, I don't need these pills or, you know, and then I would just sink down the hole again. And it was finally, uh, was in, was like 2011, 12, man, after talking to Coach Summit and having an incident in Atlanta, like Coach Summit said, listen, like you, you have to get healthy. She goes, your life depends on it. You know, everything that you, you've been through and she was struggling with dementia. So there's this parallel, you know, both mental illnesses, right? Me and my coach and she's, her strength, through her battle is helping me, you know, she's like, you got to hang around people that know your character, um, that know you, that's how you're going to get your life together. And I did just that. I actually uh, moved back home to New York for a while. Um, I was really around my community and the people that knew me. I started getting therapy regularly. I started taking my med medication regularly. I wasn't in denial anymore. So, you know, we have adversity, you know, but, you know, we, we have that adversity happen in our life. You know, finally, there comes this uh, thing for me. It was like an acceptance, you know, like, OK, this is this is what I, I have to deal with. You know, I had to educate myself. I had to become aware. And when I when I started to step in that awareness, you know what, I had to take, I had to take action. This is what I tell people. I'm aware now, I know what's going on. My mind is clear. I have to take action. That action was me waking up every morning, making sure I take my medication. Before I go to bed, taking my medication. Um, and also go, going to therapy, learning how to talk about things. I used to think, oh my God, from movies and the way it was depicted, oh, if you sit on the couch, you're crazy. Uh, no, you're not. It's, it's just a way for you to uh, talk to somebody and not feel judged, you know? And I learned to really talk about things that I was stuffing inside. And let me tell you, everyone, my life just, just totally, uh, totally changed. And I, I'm so thankful for my support because I damaged a lot of relationships when I was um, sick. I damaged relationships with family uh, and, and friends and to be in a place of clarity and to go and apologize, to work on those relationships, it was a humbling, a humbling thing, you know? And I'm just happy that um, I've just been able to stay, stay the course 
And it's not just me. It's me when I go speak to these uh, collegiate athletes, these young people, these, these companies. It's me being transparent. You know, I put it out there, you know, and just tell them how it is and to see how they connect with me. And they always, I always walk away. Like, they're always like, Miss Host Club, you're, oh my God, thank you. I felt the same thing. And I'm, and, and thank you for helping me. And I'm like, no, this is a team thing. You know, we're teammates. You, you, you're, you may think I'm helping you, but you're, you're helping me also. You're helping me find purpose. You're um, helping me just be my most authentic self and live in my truth. And so that's the thing with, with, mental, uh, with, with mental health uh, issues, mental health concerns. You know, a lot of times everybody wants to be on the medical site, <laughs> right? We Google stuff. Oh, my God, I, I, I think I have this and that. And I always tell people, we are all, everybody on this call can, is mental health, right? It's just the thing is, you know, some people are seasonal. You know, uh, the weather can change. Um, you know, you can have a loss of a job or something. And, you, you know, you're, you're trying to process, you're dealing with that stress. But as things start to change, it gets better for you, right? And then you have people on the other side of it that have a chemical imbalance so the emotions can be all over the place for me myself I suffer from bipolar disorder so I have extreme highs where the highs I'm the life of the party I'm talking like a hundred miles per minute I'm really energized but the flip side of that is great socially sometimes I come down and when I come down it could be, you know, three or four days just wanting to be locked in a house, um, not really want to talk to anyone. So I know in my life, I have to make sure I take the medication, make sure that I'm practicing uh, good habits. So example, it's coronavirus. We're dealing with it, everyone across the world. And here I am now in New York, and I'm, I'm in my house a lot, right? <laughs> uh, we're, in it, we're in the heat of it. And trying to I'm a person that's on a go so my life has totally changed and I found my anxiety kicking in um, even though I know these healthy habits I have to always tell people there's no such thing as a magic pill right yes I have to take the medication but I also have to do the daily work so fitness is for me uh, meditation quiet time well what do you say? Quiet town. We have a five month old baby. <laughs> like, how am I navigating this? Well, I had to really get on a schedule and I have to wake up 6 a.m. in the morning uh, and make sure I'm the first one up. Make sure I have at least two hours to myself to work out, to read or whatever. That makes me feel um, good. So I think a part of it is everyone out there, if you're going through these emotions, you know, really try to say, all right, how am I spending my day? Am I getting fresh air? Um, is exercise going to help me? Just don't isolate yourself. Make sure you're hopping on some video calls to talk to a friend. You know, even if you have to go and be in chat rooms, you you have to have some type of uh, release, I would say. Yeah. So one thing, you know, before uh, talking about, about the, you know, what post-career, and for you from this perspective, I want to draw uh, our audience attention to that moment where, where you know, your, your, your friend found you when, when you overdosed. And, and because I had, you know, when I, when I was living in Romania, I had a, a, an exactly a similar experience with my friend overdosed and I found her and I took her to the hospital. And, and how important it is to actually be aware of the situation for your friends, for the people that you know. Because as you said, uh, you know, this is not rare. That means, you know, suicidal tendencies do happen. And, and right. those uh, those surrounding you need to be uh, alert and need, need to be aware and need to be helpful. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, for for my friends, uh, I think that opened a lot of their eyes, and it's just having honest conversations. And for me, being able to say, "All right, I'm having a bad day," you know, before I would keep it inside. Um, I need to talk to you, and or my friends know now, like they take it serious. All right, let's go to the movie or let's do something, uh, let's communicate. But also, it's, it, I would feel sometimes putting that burden on them, you feel really bad, you know? But these are people that like love you. And I would tell you as a, a, a person that's talked to young people, and unfortunately, 
you have a friend sometimes, and we probably can all relate to this in maybe different circumstance that, oh, I'm going to kill myself or I'm going to take my life. When people are constantly talking about this, take it very serious. I know of a situation where a young person got, to, you know, with their best friend, oh man, this, this guy is always talking about this. And the one time when he didn't take it serious, taking it serious, maybe um, if you're on a college campus or educational place, alerting, you know, one of the higher ups that this person is dealing with this, whether it be a coach or a support system, um, as a friend, maybe um, going to be with that person and, and, and navigating that because this guy, that one time he didn't want to take it serious, he lost his friend and that pain you know, it's been probably five or six years ago and he's carrying that every day. And it's just, you know, offering support. A lot of times as, as a friend, I didn't want people to fix me. Those are the people that I ran away from was like, you know, trying to, you need to do this, you need to do that. The thing that helped me was when people say, you know what, I'm here for you. I love you. You know, if you need to talk, I'm here. And that's when I saw saw the shift because no one wants to feel like they're broken, you know, and, and, that's, and that's a big thing uh, when you deal with people with these challenges. Definitely. So, um, again, the, the end of our story, and then we go to, to, um, to questions. Um, so you played Atlanta Dream, San Antonio, you, you retired once, you came back, you played uh, there in Europe, um, and then post career. So, so how this whole thing evolved, uh, you know, leading as far as I understood to the right diagnostic actually for you. Uh, that, right. That, could, that was, was, you know, so important, you know, you got the right medicine and you got to exactly what you described a little bit earlier, this balance in life that, that uh, right. you know, how did you get there? Oh man, um, just finally deciding to, to do the work because you know, I was challenged from, you know, people in my life, like, you don't want this up and down roller coaster, you know, you're, you're a great person, and you give to a, a lot of people. And now it's like, you're sitting on this island by yourself, you know, this inconsistent um, personality. And so, um, you know, I'm a competitor. <laughs> I, I love to compete. I love to, to prove, you know, people wrong. And I just wanted to be the best daughter, the best friend. I wanted my quali quality of life uh, to, to improve. I knew how even going out of my house, it, it got so bad where I would have like social anxiety. I didn't really like to be in, in crowds. And I'm like, this is not me. Like I'm from New York. I'm used to being around a lot of people. And I, I just really humbled myself and, and did the work. And it's not easy because you have to really go through, I had to go through my life. I had to learn what peer support was. I had to go talk about these things around people I didn't know. That's a part of the, the healing process. And then that's when I realized something key as much as we think that we're different, you know, cause I'm in that room, I'm like, I don't identify with these people. As much as we think we're different, we're the same. And once we realize that a lot of things change for us. Definitely. So now I think it's a shock for you to see New York almost empty, you know, probably for the first time in your life. That's yes, all life. <laughs> yes. I, yeah. I just I, I just drove down to the city uh, this past weekend. Um, I just drove, I, I just was showing Kara around. Kara's my uh, wife. I wanted to show her like New York and she's like, wow, as many times as I've been here, I've just never seen it like this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's unique. Uh, so now let's go to Anna uh, to see if you have any questions and, and you know, okay. any interaction with the, with the audience. Uh, and again, you know, um, thank you so much for, for, for sharing all these aspects of, of your life. It really makes a difference, both for people in this type of situation, but also people who have friends, people they know that might uh, go through mm -hmm. these struggles. Because you, you, you are such an accomplished person and such an amazing person in many ways. And at the same time, you, you won this battle with, with is probably mm -hmm. the, the worst enemy that you could have that was not on the on the court but rather in your life so, so I think it's remarkable so let's Thank say you. let's see Anna Anna so so what what, what do we have any any, uh, any questions we have maybe? we have some questions we'll start with Deepika Deshwal she is our friend from India and she she is asking about uh, your best moments in your life which one is oh. your best moments 
Let's talk my about best, good, good time. Positive. Um, my best moments. Uh, first of all, uh, getting my college degree um, in, in, in four years uh, from University of Tennessee, that was a highlight because my family is like really big on education. And my grandmother said, you're not going anywhere if you're not going to graduate. And you can't take five years. You have to do it in four or else you won't be playing basketball if you can't take it serious. And so to, to accomplish that, for her to be there, to give that to my family was amazing. Um, and secondly, being drafted, number one, because the NBA offices are here in New York at WNBA. And so I got the opportunity to be drafted in my home state, my, my city. So that was really amazing to walk away from that situation and have your family and good friends who have supported you um, get to witness that. And I would say, uh, lastly, like I've had like how oh, basketball has given so many memories, but I would say becoming a mom, like, I, I always, I've always been great with children, but to have like your own and, and experience that daily, it's, it's life changing. I'm realizing different things about myself. Uh, and I'm glad that I'm experiencing this in a, in a good mindset, you know, being um, um, healthy because it's so, it's so joyous. <laughs> yeah. He's this very cute baby. I, I'm oh, thank you. Yeah, he's amazing. Uh, we have a question from, um, I know that you remember our friend Hisham from Casablanca. I'll see if, oh, he, yeah. Yeah, if he can ask his question himself. Hisham, can you please unmute your microphone and ask your question? Hi. Hello, Hi. everyone. Hi, Kimika. How are you doing? Here again. Hi, Vlad. Anna, good to see you again. Hi. So my question is, do you think that um, the women's basketball has the same support as uh, men basketball? Like if we're talking about Morocco, 75 of our coaches, if you ask them if they want to coach men or women's, they will choose men's, of course. So what do you think? Uh, can you unmute? Uh, yeah, okay, good. All right, there we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think um, it's been this shift. I think it's really changing. Of course, men's basketball has been around way longer than the women's game, as we know, professionally, um, the dunks, the highlights. But it's been amazing watching the women's game grow. And a lot of my NBA friends who played, a lot of them are coaching. They're like, man, I love coaching the women more. Um, and they're actually helping grow the game. It's exciting. We have a new, um, we basically have our own uh, business team now. Before we were really, we're, we're, we were operating under the uh, NBA umbrella. Now it's like our separate thing. So we're able to do more marketing deals. Um, as you saw, the salary increase for women. And that's just a way, you know, a, a good way to go. But yeah, man, you know, they got to they gotta give the women some love over there. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's a it's an opportunity to build something great you know um people a lot of people don't understand starting at the ground and and, and building some so you can look back one day and if you have daughters or something be like man you know what i remember being a part of this and and, and helping it grow and uh, continuing this question um in europe uh, women basketball is bigger than in us i mean yeah it's more attractive lots of players from us are going to play why you think is what's missing there? Man, you you mean meaning why it's it's bigger in Europe? Yeah, I mean Man. something in in US. So the, like maybe short period of the league or 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 money or what's what's. Oh there? man, I just think uh, so many other distractions and so okay. so much stuff like this going on. You know, I love playing uh, abroad. And I know sometimes I'm like, maybe I enjoy playing abroad more than I enjoyed playing um, here in the States just because of less of a distraction to other things. And then it's like these small towns or whatever. And it's just this, um, people are loyal, this loyal feeling for your club and to support them. And it's not just one team. They're going for the soccer. 
then they they go to the next season and they're w- willing to like fight the other team. <laughs> it's uh it's it's a different uh intensity and a different pride and it, it's to the point where I can't even you know it is it's I can't even compare the two because they're so so different and then you're playing in um in the states here we're playing in these big arenas you know, 20 something thousand plus and that many people are not, you know, necessarily coming to the game. So it's all this like empty space sometimes. Yeah. Whereas when you're abroad, you're in these small places and it's like, you can feel the fans, you feel the excitement. So uh, I don't know, it's just, it's very different and both are uh, impactful in their um, own, own way, you know, here. And you can probably tell me here in the States, you know, of course it's about marketing, um, it's about brand, you know, the branding piece. I, I, I don't know uh, if it's like that uh, to that extent overseas. You could probably educate me on that because I knew I just went and I played. And sometimes sometimes yeah. maybe I didn't uh, understand or, you know, especially with the language barrier some places, what was really going on. Yeah, they have some marketing stuff as well, but the, the, the game is growing very, you know, the woman game is growing uh, very well in, in Europe, in Russia. You know, what, what, one thing yeah. for sure, Anna, if you guys in WNBA will start playing soon before the NBA, all the eyes will be on you. Because, for example, I could tell you, last week I was watching soccer games of the German league that I don't know anything about just because they're playing. So, so I, I think that you know this might be a, a, a good opportunity for, for sports that are not as popular in the United States to become suddenly very popular. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, so we go to next question from Mehdi. Uh, so I have a two years old daughter, and I want to know what it takes to become an exceptional player. Also, as father and coach, how can I help her to become so? Well, first of all, um, you know it's going to take practice, 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 and uh, building a healthy relationship because you know how it is coaching your your kids sometimes and I have a lot of friends that experience this uh, uh, we're guilty of uh, living vicariously through your through your child so you want to make sure that uh, he or she she actually enjoys it you know keeping it keeping it fun but understanding the hard work you know and a lot of kids nowadays struggle with that you know they want the end result they have to understand it's not just practice when you're with the team. You have to want to practice on your own, dribbling, shooting, um, in order to want to even have a, a, a chance to get at that level. You know, uh, it's a small percentage, as we know, that actually get to move on to professional sports. But for me, when I was younger, uh, I just I really was in a position and, and I was talented to just enjoy it. You know, high school. I really enjoyed just being with my teammates. It, it was a lot of fun. And my family, they were not just, you have to do this, you have to do that. They just came to the games and, and cheered for me and, and made sure if I wanted to practice that I had the things that I needed. But it's internal. I, 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 I think I became successful because I wanted to and I worked on it. Oh, we have a question from Mahmoud Tebi again about almost the same for uh, what advice do we have for the girls players uh, age 12, 14 and 16, 18? Uh, so what's what's the main thing for them to do? Uh, of course, you know, I could say practice, practice, work on your skills, the things that you're not good at. Those are the things that you should <laughs> probably work on um, the, the most. But it's just understanding um the past of the game, you know, how we, how we're building this equity. I think a lot of young ladies here, I go into a gym and I said, Oh, okay. Oh, what do you guys want to play? Oh, we want to play the WNBA. Or we want to do this. Okay. Name me five players in the WNBA outside of Elena Della Don, Candace Parker. I don't know. How do you not know? How can you want to go someplace and you don't know the pioneers, the past. When I was younger, I knew all the, man, I remember like learning about the Brazilian players that were playing and I knew all about the Teresa Edwards, all these players. And I I didn't see no women's, I knew men's too. So I became a student of the game and that's what you have to become. You know, it's like easy to go out there and physical, not not easy, but physical, getting out there on the court and doing the drills and stuff. That's, That's work, but understanding, watching and saying, okay, I want, I, I want to, I'm a big guard. So I want to 
practice. I want to be a guard like Shamiko, but I have to figure out what she does well in her game and add it to mine. The greatest player, Michael Jordan, said every offseason, I added something new to my game, you know, so I could become better. And so I, I took that mindset. Like in the offseason, I'm like, okay, I'm good at this. Let me try to get better than that. Because I hated playing defense. <laughs> I was just naturally gifted because I was uh, tall and I had long arms. And so I just really was like, man, let me really work on these uh, foot speed drills and, and having this intensity because I took pride in me scoring. I don't want to score 20 points and my players score 20 points also. It just takes away from it. So I don't know, just, just having that mindset, that winner's mentality. Yeah, all right, I see, thank you. So we have um, a question from Kenya, from Jude Titus. Uh, Holsko, you are such an inspiration even to the boy child out there, especially in Nairobi, Kenya and Africa. How have you dealt with or deal with racism? Oh man, it's a, that's an ever uh, evolving thing. Um, and, it's, and it's really uh, difficult. Um, because I always tell people like, all right, you know, I've, I've, I've went to these like great schools and I'm always like the minority, you know, and it's always, always that place of acceptance, you know, it's like, oh, that's Shamiqua. Oh, she, you know, I'm, I'm not a threat, as I was saying, you know, because they are, are, are around me, but I understand a power in that is to um, educate people. And I learned that honestly, from playing overseas because when I would go to these places, some of them never saw a black person <laughs> or, or a person like my, you know, with my hair or whatever. And they would just like stare. And then I learned to like have conversation. What is it you want to ask me? Let's talk. Black people are just not like the, what you see on television. That's not necessarily real life. And, and we learn. And a lot of times now my friends are like, Oh my God, I had this, whole idea of what you know Americans were especially people of color and you're you're not like that and you help me see the see the world and so in bringing that mindset is, is is education is the key right so bringing that to my community you know and, and uplifting others that look like me and also when I'm having platforms because I get to have those platforms is telling people how their their fear is affects me and it affects people that look like me. So it's a it's an ever evolving thing where you just have to have um, tough conversations. And you know, right now in the, in the U.S., we're having a lot of those um, conversations, and it gets uncomfortable for some. But I'm realizing that um, now that it's out on the table, I'm realizing in my circle of friends, which is very diverse, um, you're finding a lot of allies and and people that want to bring about change. And so that's that's the key, you know, in this in this country, I mean, it hasn't even been what is it? Dad, is it like six, 60 years, you know, not even not even 60 years since the civil rights movement. So it's still relatively um, young, but it's just people that have a voice, you know, these activists out there working tirelessly, um, wanting, wanting, wanting change. So hopefully we get there. <laughs> yeah, hopefully <laughs> soon. Right, right, right. Uh, we have two questions, very interesting questions from Patila Sadurian. She's from Lebanon and she participated in one of our exchange programs. She's a young okay. girl playing basketball in Lebanon, Beirut. So she's asking how much you have suffered from your social life because of basketball. Oh, voila, a lot. <laughs> that, is a, that is a great question. Um, I, you know, even growing up, I didn't get to just like hang out and have summers with my friends. I had to play AAU basketball, organ, you know, organized uh, activities to get to my, my end goal. And so it's, it's, it's tough. It's a sacrifice. You know, if you want something, sometimes you got to sacrifice. And um, I gave up a, a lot. And I know it can be hard because when you have those moments when you want to connect with those friends, you feel you're, you're there, but you feel so disconnected because they're spent more time together. And uh, the flip side of it is that you get to really build a relationship, sisterhood with your teammates and stuff. But I get it. It's, it's socially, it's really um, a drag. So you're not the only one that's uh, experiencing that. Uh, I, I, I went through it. I went through it. 
Perfect. So she has another question, which is uh -huh. I think, a better question. How can okay. someone become a professional player when they are living in a non-professional country where there is not enough support for this sport? Like, uh, wow, uh, man. Di the diamond in the rough, right? You gotta, <laughs> you, you, you have to do things that uh, really make yourself stand out. And I feel now that it's more opportunities because of social media. I think um, the internet really plays a key. So, you know, making tapes, contacting different teams, you know, a, a lot of young players do highlight tapes. I've got opportunities from other countries. I know here um, with my friends that uh, coach college, college coaches they they get a lot of international kids and it could be something from sometimes competition someone you know sending in the tape or whatever so there's a there's a chance you know don't just be like oh I live in this small place I don't have any exposure you know you gotta you gotta put the pedal to the metal keep working on your game send out footage contact people and build relationships and as you see now I mean through these zooms this conferences with the changing of the world you know this is this is where it's at <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, uh so we finished with questions but shamika we have here um your friend our friend that came with us uh to columbia in exchange program chastity melvin is here hey, she is now uh in viola and i would like her to say uh, a couple of words. Chastity, can you can you hear us? Let's see. Chastity. Uh, Chastity? Okay. Okay, maybe she She'll come. Hey, here. everyone. Oh, she's here. OK. Hi. Hey, I hey, just Chess. stopped by to support you guys. Um, what's up, Meek? Hey, what's up, Chess? How's everything? You a mama now, so I, I can't relate to you anymore, I mean, at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, congr congratulations on, on the job and stuff. Maybe y'all, you see them banners behind me. Y'all got the pressure just to hang them banners. <laughs> 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 it's no pressure right now it's just you know it's just learning but um yeah, yeah. i just dropped in to say hello to everyone i've, I've been uh, on zoom meetings all morning but me I, i'm starting the podcast so you gotta come on my podcast oh definitely definitely send me the information but it was great it was great i was listening in and doing different things but shout out to Vladi, all you guys so i was just stopping in to say hello okay bye bye, <laughs> bye, -bye. <laughs> I'll go back uh, to thanks <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chastity. And if you have, um, you know, information about the podcast, we could um, actually, you know, give it to everybody who attends this webinar and, and all our network and the same thing with the State Department, just to keep in touch with what you, what you do. Mm -hmm. So if you send us the, the information, uh, we, could, we could spread the word about the podcast. Okay. All right. Yeah, definitely. And also, uh, uh, follow two alliances, uh, well, two organizations that uh, one is JED Foundation, J-E-D Foundation, and it's for wellness uh, and emotional health with youth. And I'm an ambassador for that organization as well as an alliance, Same Here Alliance. So Same Here Alliance is a bunch of athletes who've come together to create change in the mental health space. And so those are both near and dear to my heart. Um, if you want to check out my podcast, it's on Apple or Spotify. It's called Tremendous Upside. Um, shout out to uh, American Public Media who gave me that platform. It is me interviewing um, former athletes, great athletes of our time, and their struggles with emotional health. And so it's really a, a pos positive piece because you look at the statistics and the things that these athletes have done. And for me, um, also learning about them because I saw their amazing play, but I didn't know that they was dealing with these things. And so um, check it out. And if you want to follow me in my adventures, uh, you can find me on uh, Instagram, mainly Instagram and Twitter and at C-H-O-L-D-1. And just, you know, continue to support, um, continue to, to spread the word to, to other people that you may, may know uh, that have, have similar journeys to myself and empower them. So I, I was, this was awesome. Any, any more about it? 
Um, sure. So um, you said um, at some point that if it wasn't for sports, people may not have been able to see your struggle. And, and mm -hmm. this leads me to uh, actually uh, trying to invite uh, Ryan Murphy from the State Department to say a few words, because uh, I think that that's the whole idea of, of um, this public diplomacy sports program, to use sports as a tool in your life is a perfect illustration of how important mm -hmm. sports have been to give you a voice, to advocate for important causes, uh, and to make a difference in pe people's, people's lives. So mm -hmm. I, saw, I saw both Ryan and, and actually Ashley, um, also a little bit earlier, but I think Ashley is not with us anymore, that maybe, maybe Ryan could say a few words about, in general, about the programs. And if you have any questions, Ryan, you know, please do. So let's hope that this would connect with Ryan towards the end of our uh, webinar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, <clears throat> Shamiqua. It's such an inspiring story, obviously, mm -hmm. on such a topic that most people try to shy away from and, and don't like mm -hmm. to bring to the forefront. So thank you very much for doing that. Appreciate it. Um, one real quick question. Obviously, you've been involved in some of the State Department programs. You traveled to uh, Morocco in 2018 on one of the World Learning Programs. Mm -hmm. uh, you also went out as a sports envoy to Senegal in 2012, uh, as well as other trips. And you alluded to it a little bit earlier that you walked away from the trip to Colombia, kind of learning more about yourself and taking more away than you felt like you gave to everyone that you interacted with. Mm -hmm. How have some of the other trips that you've taken overseas, aside from playing overseas and going to the Olympics, how have some of these people to people exchange trips really impacted your life and how have they, how, what have you taken away from those trips that you can share with others? Well, I think the first thing, like growing up here in New York in the, in the inner city um, and being um, in the situations where it was like low resource. And when I was taking these, when I go on these trips, especially one that sticks with me is the, the Senegal trip, you know, here we are, you know, at the, at the grassroots, we were in those gyms with no AC, you know, um, you know, seeing how uh, the kids, some of the kids didn't have the, the proper gear, but this connection, this love, you know, of, of sports, this excitement that they had, um, and maybe they didn't know anything about the career, but this human compassion and nurturing, like, oh my God, you're a basketball player, this excitement, you're different for me, and this building this this bond and it's interesting because I have now again with social media some of the kids that have contacted me over the years some of the adults um, over there with the embassy that have kept in contact about the programs they're doing and it builds this community uh, of support and it's just you know you're, you're just giving you're, you're passing on you're giving you're giving back but again like I said Ryan I walk away with just a different understanding a, a different um a compassion like you know being more compassionate and, and energized to help really change um you know someone's life by giving them opportunity they didn't necessarily foresee perfect and and really that's the reason why we do these programs it's to mm -hmm. to bring communities together and to have those underserved under underprivileged communities overseas mm -hmm. meet an american for the first time and and really right. hear your story and and vice versa, when we bring the groups to the US, a uh, number of the people that are on this uh, webinar are mm -hmm. exchange participants of a lot of these programs. So mm -hmm. they've been able to experience it firsthand. So it's, it's mm -hmm. great to hear um, your story and, and what impact it has had on your life. So hopefully if you're uh, willing and able and want to go out again as a sports envoy and do more of these trips, we're, we're happy to have you involved. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Once we can all travel again freely, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hopefully it'll stop being virtual at some point and we can actually get in person again and, and right. really start to play basketball again and, and get out on the yeah. court. Definitely. This idea of going out makes me very optimistic. So it's very good at the beginning of the day to hear that going out <laughs> is an option. So, right. so um, you know, Shamika, I want to, to thank you very much for, for, for being with us. Um, I know that Ashley is still with us. Ashley is also in running uh, webinars uh, of the sports diplomacy uh, division, and they're extremely exciting. Every Wednesday, as far as I know, to receive from, from Ryan and Ashley advertisements about, about those, uh, those webinars. We are trying our best to 
um, you know, again, during this time of, of crisis and, and unusual time in all our lives to bring to our audiences stories that are relevant. And I, I cannot think, you know, you know, from the people that we know that we are in touch with, that participate in our programs of a person, you know, better equipped than, 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 than Shamika to bring something so relevant into our, into our lives. So, Shamika, thanks so much for, uh, for being with us. And again, as Ryan said, you know, let's hope that uh, this will end soon and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, meet, we'll meet in person. And then uh, from the next exchange, you'll bring the baby, hopefully. Yeah. Oh, definitely, Thomas. definitely. Thomas. Okay. Yes. Good. Okay. So back, to, back, to, back, back to Anna. Okay. Right. Thank you, Shamika. It's really appreciated. And it's always, you know, inspiring to talk to you, to be next to you. And thank you again for showing everybody how inspiring your story is. And oh, thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And hope we will meet again um, on webinars and uh, very soon right. in person. <laughs> Uh, thank right. I want also to thank Ryan and Vlad for being uh, mm -hmm. with us mm -hmm. today and uh, thank you everybody, thank you all participants. Uh, one more time I want to um, remind you that this webinar was arranged by World Learning and Digital Communication Network and supported by Sport Diplomacy. So stay in touch, follow uh, Shamika on social media, follow DCN mm -hmm. on social media, and you will know about our next webinars. Thank you, everybody, and stay safe. Bye. Bye. Thank you.